you so much. We thank you. We're so grateful for who you are. You are a redeemer. Oh, Lord, you, you give worth to worthless things like me. Father, you are so good. Lord, we've, we've praised you in song. We've worshiped you that way because you are good, because you're good to us. Lord, because of what you've done for us. And now, Lord, help us to hear your word, that we could respond to your word in a way that shows that love that we would worship you by hearing your word and doing it. Lord, give us ears to hear now. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of today's teaching is The Loyalty of Love. We seldom think of those two concepts as to having anything to do with each other, right? I mean, we could kind of don't put those two together, but they are linked. They're very much linked. In fact, when you think about something as basic as marriage, being faithful, or another word for that is being loyal to your spouse, should be because of love, right? I mean, that's why we remain true, because we love that other person. Uh, what causes us to remain loyal to God and not being involved in idolatry or to walk away from Him or, or uh, walk into a, a lifestyle of sin uh, and compromise and all that? That should be all motivated by our love for Him, right? Not rules and regulations, not the law or anything like that, but because we love Him. We know that God puts an extremely high priority on love, don't we? At least we should. But I think it's one of those things that we should be reminded about pretty often because I think we forget. You know, in the first three verses of 1 Corinthians 13, you don't have to turn there right now, uh, but the point is made that even if we do all kinds of cool spiritual things, if we do not have love, if we're not walking in love, then we're just making meaningless noise. We are nothing. And, and no matter what we do, it doesn't do us any good or the people around us any good. Jesus said the two most important commandments or the greatest commandments was one to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? And the second one was like it, he said, and that is to love our neighbor as ourself. It's all about love. Jesus also said in John 13, 35, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. See, we can do all kinds of things in the name of Jesus. You know, we can carry our 10-pound Bible to church. You know, hey, I'm Christian, I got a big old Bible. Hey, you know, nothing wrong with a 10-pound Bible. You know, that's great. <laughs> but we can put the stickers on our cars. We can do all kinds of different things. But it's only when we love, Jesus said, that people can really see that we belong to Him. He didn't say they'll know you are my disciples by your bumper stickers or by your witness wear t-shirts, which those are good things. I got them. I wear them. In 1 John 4, 7 and 8, we're told, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God for God is love. Think about that. God is love. So of course love is a big deal to God, right? He is love. And if we belong to Him, then we should be loving each other and we should be loving Him, right? We should be living, walking in love. That's how we're to live. But again, we don't usually see loyalty associated with love or as a product of love but as we'll see here in Ruth chapter 1, love, real love, causes loyalty to God and to others. Let's read the first two verses here in Ruth 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. 
And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. So here we are, we're introduced to this family of four. And we're told their names, and their names are very interesting. <laughs> Elimelech, his name means, my God is king. Cool name, huh? Yeah, he had some, had some pretty good parents to name him that. <laughs> and, and Naomi, her name means pleasant. And then they had two sons, though. And they named them Malon, which means sickly, and Chilion, which means pining or wasting away. Who names their son sickly or pining, right? <laughs> it's, it's weird. But we know that from time to time, God would bring famine on a land, especially on his people, uh, to cause them to repent, to cause them to turn from their sin and back to him. And we see here it says this happened when the judges ruled. And like we just saw for a couple of months, there was plenty of sin going on in the time of the judges, right? Lots of it. So at some point, God brought this famine to chasten his children, to bring them back to himself. And this family here, Elimelech, he leads his family uh, to go to Moab, not just to buy supplies, but as verse 1 says, to dwell in the country of Moab. And verse 2 says, they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Folks, they should have stayed in their land. <laughs> they, they were never commanded to go. And, you know, when we look through the, the Bible, when we look through the Old Testament, whenever God's people, they, they go to another land and God hasn't told them to, never good. It's never a good thing. What they should have done was stayed in their land, repented of any sin in their lives personally, trusted God to provide. And as we'll see, others did that, and they made it through the famine. Sometimes, as believers, we don't always respond in the right way to God's chastisement, do we? And you know, I know, hunger is a, a powerful force, and it's caused people to do a lot worse than go someplace where they ought not to be. But look at verses 3 through 5. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. Now they took wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. Then both Malon and Chilion also died. So the woman survived her two sons and her husband. Notice this. The very thing that they tried to avoid by going to Moab happened anyway. Three out of four of them died. Folks, running from problems is never the right thing to do. Never. We should always stay and work out our problems with whoever we have the problems with according to the Word of God. We should always allow the Word of God to dictate how to respond to different problems. Running is never the answer. Now, other translations word it a little bit clearer that after Dad died, the sons took wives and they lived there ten years. And it might be, it got me thinking, it might be that since Dad died ten years before the boys, that when they were born, dad possibly had already become sickly. And by the time of the second son's birth, dad was pining away, wasting away. And so maybe they named their sons accordingly. That's a real possibility, right? But now mom, Naomi, is left alone in a foreign land with two widowed daughters-in-law. And you know, God has always got a way to get us back to where He wants us to be, doesn't He? He's got a way of doing that. Which, being where God wants us to be, is always what is best for us. We need to understand that too. Now folks, God is a redeemer. He redeems, He, he gives worth again. That's what redeem means. He buys back, He brings worth to worthless situations. And He gives hope to hopeless situations. Look at verses 6 through 10. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited His people by giving them bread. 
Therefore she went out from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, Surely we will return with you to your people. So here we see Naomi's daughters-in-law, they loved her. And that they both were good wives to Naomi's sons, and they were kind to Naomi. And because Naomi loved them, she let them off the hook. Do you see that? Now go on back. Go back to your, your folks' house, you know? Go back to your mom's house, each of you. God bless you both. It's basically what she's saying. But notice this. Both of them said, surely we will return with you to your people. Now, you got to understand, and there's, there's those things that you see throughout the Old Testament especially. You see these cultural things in the Middle Eastern culture. It was customary to object to something like this at least once. Oh, no, 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 no. We're not going to go. We're going to stay with you. It was like you had to do that at least once. <laughs> but, but then in 11 through 13, but Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. See, they were under what was referred to as the Leveret Law. That law said that if a husband died... If he had a brother, then that brother had to marry his widow, had to, to take her as his wife and give her children. But those children would be considered her first husband's, her, her, her late husband's children. Now we, that, that, that husband would have children in his name and his, his lineage would continue on. And so that's what she's talking about. But she says, look, I, you know, I don't have any other sons. Even if I got married tonight... Nine months later, had a son. Would you wait for him to grow up? <laughs> you know, it's like, come on. <laughs> Got me thinking, okay, this is kind of a bizarre thing. But if she did have sons, you know, and maybe son number three, you know, he, he's, he's getting to be 12, 13 years old. Hey, mom, why is Aunt Orpa looking at me kind of funny? <laughs> She's thinking, okay, how soon, you yeah? know? But what Naomi is saying is, you know, gals, you deserve to be married. You deserve to have children and be happy. Folks, understand, that's love. Naomi is putting the needs. She's putting the blessings of others over her own needs, over her own desires. While Naomi is putting their desires above hers, she's not really giving them good counsel, though. Why would you send someone, especially women you love, back into a culture of idolatry? You, you really wouldn't do that, would you? Even though it might be convenient, even though it might be kind of an immediate uh, uh, comfort and all that. If you love somebody, don't you kind of think long term about them? I mean, most of us have raised kids, right? I and mean, hopefully, as parents, you weren't thinking of the immediacy of the moment. But they really want that piece of candy. They want that bowl of ice cream instead of, instead of supper. You know, I want them to be happy. No, you think long term, right? Think, no, you need to eat a, a good balanced diet. So you, you want what's best. And, you know, she's, she's really not doing them a service by encouraging them to go back into a culture of idolatry. It's not a good thing. Now, some point out that 
the reason why that happens is be, because Naomi is actually backslidden at this point and not really walking with the Lord. And we'll see this again, but Naomi is convinced that all that's happened to her is because, as she says here, the hand of the Lord was against her. I don't believe God's hand was against her. I really don't. I, I believe her husband took her someplace where he shouldn't have taken them. And God, and I believe as we'll see over the next couple of weeks, that God is actually in the process of redeeming this bad situation. But here we see what's all too common today. When well-meaning people aren't walking with the Lord, they give bad counsel. Verse 14, Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. <laughs> it's kind of like every Hallmark movie. you got to have women crying at some point, right? <laughs> Going at it again. They're crying again. <laughs> now, notice this, though, that Orpah kissed Naomi goodbye. All right. But Ruth clung to her. Ruth wouldn't let Naomi go. Folks, that's love. Right? It's interesting, the names of these two gals. Orpah literally means maim. You know, like a maim on the back of a neck of a horse or the back of a, of a lion. Uh, and and it, it came to mean the back of the neck or to turn one's back as in seeing the neck, or as in leaving, if somebody turned their back on you. And that's just what Orpah did here. Turned her back on Naomi, and went back to her, her family, and her foreign gods, and all that. Ruth, it's interesting, her name means friend or friendship. And she lived up to that name, too. Being a friend to Naomi. And then look at verses 15 through 17. And she said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. What a statement of loyalty, huh? But folks, it was motivated by the love that Ruth had for Naomi. And I also believe it was motivated by the love that Ruth had come to have for Naomi's God, for Yahweh. Because even though Elimelech, my God, is king, and his wife Naomi made a wrong decision in going to Moab, they must have told Ruth about Yahweh. They must have shared with her all the things that God had done for his people, and bringing them out of Egypt, and, and all of the love that God had for his people, and his strength, his power, all that. And Ruth must have developed a love for Yahweh over the course of, of being in that family for possibly as much as 10 years. And here, Ruth makes a conscious decision to not go back to the gods that she grew up with. And instead, she professes loyalty to Yahweh. Your God shall be my God. And notice this too. She calls on Yahweh to hold her accountable for this pledge that she has made. The Lord, remember, anytime we see in the Old Testament the word Lord in all capital letters, that's the translators letting us know that what's actually there are the letters YHWH, the, the proper name of God. And so she's actually saying, Yahweh, do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. Folks, understand, that's an acknowledgment of the reality that Yahweh is God and that He could do something to her if she broke her pledge. There's so much love going on here. But in order to really see it, to really see this, this real love within this account, I think we need to look to what God defines as real love. Now go ahead and turn over there to 1 Corinthians 13. And we're going to look at verses 4 through 7. And we're going to kind of break them apart a little bit and look at each aspect or uh, attribute of love, or attribute, I should say. 
First, in verse 4, it says, Love suffers long and is kind. Think how much suffering Ruth had done watching her husband die. Yet Naomi said she was kind to the dead, in other words, Ruth's husband, as well as to her brother-in-law through it all. And through it all, she was also kind to Naomi. She suffered long and was kind. It says love does not envy. She didn't envy her sister-in-law going back and being able to get remarried right away to, quote, get on with her life. She didn't envy. It says love does not parade itself. It's another way of saying love doesn't show off. <laughs> Look at me, how spiritual I am, how loving I am, and what a great sacrifice I'm making to you, Naomi. She doesn't say anything like that. She just served her mother-in-law and committed herself to her. She said you know, that, that she was going to be with her all the way to death. And that, that was it. She didn't make a big deal of it. Just, hey, I, I'm yours. It also says here that love is not puffed up. Some of your Bibles may use the word arrogant, proud, or conceited. Someone that's puffed up or proud always makes more of themselves than they really are. You know, they make themselves out to be more than they are. It's, it's really like cotton candy. We've all eaten cotton candy before, right? Now, as kids, you can just never really eat food, right? Not even candy. you got to play with it a little bit, right, sometimes? And I remember as a kid playing with my cotton candy, taking it and scrunching it down one time, you know? And you could take a big old thing of cotton candy, as big as your head, and do you know that if you have a little bit of moisture in your hands, you can scrunch it down, and that whole big old thing of cotton candy can fit in the palm of your hand because there's not much substance there. That's what being puffed up is. Not a whole lot of substance, but oh man, you look good, you look big, <laughs> look cool kind of thing. And through the book of Ruth, we'll never see Ruth puffed up, never proud. You know, one of those ways that we see, it, see that is whenever Naomi gives Ruth direction, she humbly receives it. She's never too proud to receive direction, even from a mother-in-law. Now that's real love, <laughs> right? In verse 5 there in 1 Corinthians 13, goes on with what love is and what it's not. In verse 5 says, love does not behave rudely. We'll never see Ruth behave rudely to anyone. Instead, she's polite to everyone she interacts with. Love does not seek its own, it says. Oh, Naomi showed love for both her daughters-in-law by letting them off the hook, by saying, no, no, you go on. She wasn't seeking her own. But we certainly see Ruth here not seeking her own. Her own perceived needs, her own desires, her own family over Naomi's family. She's all about others. We never see her ask, what's in it for me? What do I get out of this deal? Now, we will see what ends up happening to Ruth and how awesome that is. And I'm, I'm not going to say, if you don't know the story, then you'll just have to stick with us or go home and read it and, and see. But it's awesome. As we'll see, she has no idea at this point what God has in store for her. She, she has no idea. She just loves Naomi and puts Naomi first. She doesn't seek her own. It's not all about her. How can I bless my mother-in-law? How can I bless Naomi? It also says here, love is not provoked. If you have the NIV, it's worded, is not easily angered. In other words, love does not have a short fuse. You never see Ruth getting mad at God or Naomi. You got me into this, <laughs> you know, you don't see that. Also, it says love thinks no evil. If you have the NIV again, it says, it words it as, it keeps no record of wrongs. Let that sink in for a sec. When someone can rattle off a list of things that you've done to them, 
or if you can do that to somebody else, you haven't been walking in love. That person hasn't been walking in love. Just the opposite. They've been keeping score. And folks, let me tell you, if you've been keeping score in your marriage or even with a friendship, how many times that person has done this or said that or something you don't like, or, and then there's this and there's that. And sometimes I get into marriage counseling and it's like, remember Bullwinkle? Hold in the seeny bitty cord. Oops. And then the car goes, hey, and just goes off into infinity. <laughs> That's the list, man. They get all the, this stuff that the other person has done to them. Get rid of the list. You know, if you're doing that, stop it. You're not walking in love. And remember, as we started out by, by establishing the fact, love is the most important thing. Ruth has no list. You don't see her saying, I'd go with you, but you know when I first got married, you know, you made that crack at my wedding, and then later on, you know, a couple years into it, and, and this and that, and you said that, and you did this. She doesn't do that. <laughs> she doesn't say any of that. You know, no list, not even a word. Verse 6, again, love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love doesn't get happy when evil or injustice happens, but instead love is happy when the truth is presented and prevails. Someone who's walking in love would never be glad that something bad happened to someone else, even if they didn't like that other person. They wouldn't work towards something bad happening either to somebody else, you know, through slander and gossip and all that kind of stuff. And we don't see Ruth bad-mouthing her, her sister-in-law. You know, that's, she had an opportunity to do it. You know, when, when Orpah left, you, know, she doesn't, you, you don't see her saying, I hope she stubs her toe on the way back to her people, leaving us like that. I can't believe that. Can you think if she calls herself your friend? Oh, I can't believe that. She doesn't do that. She doesn't, you know, it's just no less, nothing. <laughs> just, she doesn't rejoice in equity. She's rejoicing in truth. And... And then verse 7 says, love bears all things. It means to endure patiently. In other words, we would say in our vernacular, it puts up with everything. That's what love does. <laughs> New Living Translation words it, love never gives up. You know, love never says, that's it, that's the last straw. That's not love. If you've said that, you need to check yourself. Have you repented from that kind of thinking? Because that's not love. You never see Ruth do that. She never gives up on Naomi or God. And then it says, love believes all things. That doesn't mean gullible. It means to believe the best about someone in every given situation. To assume the best or give the benefit of the doubt, we would say. You know, if somebody says or does something, if you're walking in love, then your mind automatically searches for the best possible reason or meaning to what they said or did, right? That's what we're supposed to do. That we're supposed to believe all things, believe the best out of somebody. You know, oh, did you see, you know, brother so-and-so walked that little old lady across the street? Yeah, but you know, I know why he probably did it. I bet she just tried to get into her purse. That's what it was. He, she he walking over there. Well, he, you know, he's just after that money, trying to get in that purse. I know. <laughs> yeah, it's just if you do that, stop. Start walking in love. St start believing the best. Believe the best out of people. You know, Ruth didn't say to Naomi, "You only want me to go with you because you want to use me." Or you, 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 you probably want me to go with you so you can sell me into slavery the first chance you get, huh? You're just wanting it to be easy for you. That's why you want me to go with you. You don't love me. She didn't say that. She believed the best out of her. Something real close to that says love hopes all things. That means believing all things for the future. In other words, anticipating the best for someone. That if somebody has wronged you and they've apologized, then you anticipate the best for them. <laughs> you know, love doesn't say, yeah, I know you apologized. I know you said you're sorry, but I know you're going to do it again. I don't trust you anymore. That's not love. Ruth, because she really loved Naomi, 
believed that whatever happened, or wherever they went, that Naomi would do right by her. She understood, Naomi loves me. And then it says, love endures all things, which means to stay under the load. <laughs> In Galatians 6, 2, we're told, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. See, if you love someone, you'll bear their load. You'll endure it patiently. You'll be willing to suffer with them. You'll be willing to let them cry on your shoulder and <laughs> moan and complain or whatever. And you'll love them anyway. And we, we sure see Ruth doing that kind of thing, right? I mean, willing to go through whatever Naomi was going to suffer the rest of her life. Now, was Ruth really serious about going with Naomi no matter what? Or was this just a little bit more customary objecting? Look at verse 18 back in Ruth 1. When she, that's Naomi, saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. <laughs> now, not that Naomi stopped talking to her altogether. You know, she wasn't giving her the silent treatment. Well, if you won't go away, then I ain't going to speak to you. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> She's not doing that. Naomi stopped speaking to Ruth about leaving her and going back to her home in Moab. The Net Bible, the New English translation, words that she stopped trying to dissuade her. She gave up. She said, no. Naomi understood. Ruth really loves me. She's committed to me. I need to stop <laughs> this whole line of go away, go away kind of thing. She loves me. And at this point, you might get the idea that Naomi was an easy gal to be around and that Ruth really didn't have much to endure. Now, we already heard her say, the hand of the Lord is against me, right? Look here in verses 19 to 21. Now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem, and it happened when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? But she said, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Mara means bitter, by the way. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? <laughs> the whole town is happy to see her. They're celebrating her return, but she's old Debbie Downer right here. <laughs> Don't call me pleasant. Call me bitter. God's against me. Everything's against me. The whole world, God Almighty, he, He's afflicted me. Doomed. We're all doomed. <laughs> I'm going to die and whatever. But we don't see Ruth telling her, you're so negative. You're bringing me down. I'm out of here. I am going back to my people. No, instead she got under Naomi's load. <laughs> she patiently helped Naomi through that hard time hoping all things, hoping that Naomi would eventually get through it and be her old self again. Ruth didn't give up. Folks, that's love. That's a loyalty that comes through love. And finally, in verse 22, so Naomi and Ruth, the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab, now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Now that will tie in what we'll see next week. But what about you? Are you a Ruth? <laughs> Are you someone who's walking in love? You know, it's been said that you can go back and you can read 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 7, and you can substitute the word Jesus for the word love. And it reads really well, right? I mean, think about it. Jesus suffered long and was kind. Jesus did not envy, didn't parade himself, wasn't puffed up. Jesus didn't behave rudely, didn't seek his own, wasn't provoked. Jesus didn't keep a record of wrongs. And you just keep going, right? But here's a challenge for you. Tonight, before you go to bed, open your Bible to 1 Corinthians 13 again. And then, in the place of love, put your name. How far do you get? 
I'll confess to you, I don't get very far. So I know those are the areas that I need to allow God to work in me on. And because we love Him, let's let Him help us to love. Amen? It's the most important thing. Let's stand up and pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you do love us. We thank you that you patiently endure us. You get under our load. You help us through it. Father, help us to be like you. Help us to love. Help us to love you, to love each other, and to love the lost. Because you do. Lord, we're yours. We do love you. Help our love to increase. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.